Coming up in today's newscast, Israel looks to take ties with Saudi Arabia public. The IDF reveals a third Hezbollah attack tunnel in the north, and a 450-year-old synagogue reopens in India during Hanukkah. Channel 2 Israel News has just reported that Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu allegedly desires to make relations with Saudi Arabia official before the 2019 elections in Israel. This despite an ongoing state of war between the two nations and amidst growing accusations connecting Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman with Israeli intelligence firm NSO Group regarding the murder of Saudi journalist Jamal Khashoggi. Additionally, it seems the two are potentially even connected, as some say that NSO's Pegasus program was approved and sold to the Saudis as a push for Israel to grow closer with Saudi Arabia in part of an anti-Iranian alliance. Though NSO is a private entity, sales of their Pegasus software in advanced surveillance program must be approved by the Defense Ministry's Defense Export Control Agency. NSO is refusing to confirm or deny the sale to Saudi Arabia, however, releasing a statement saying that NSO is a supplier of a product, but that the, quote, customer makes representations that the product will be used in a way that's lawful in that country. Obviously, there are sometimes abuses, end quote. Still, a sharp online critic of Saudi royals who lives in Canada, Mr. Abdulaziz, filed a lawsuit against NSO claiming that he and Khashoggi's communications were monitored. He's demanding $160,000 in damages, but NSO called the lawsuit, quote, completely unfounded. Returning now to the studio with more on Israeli-Saudi relations is Middle East expert from the Begin Sadat Center at bar -Ilan University, Dr. Mordechai Kedal. Dr. Kedal, welcome back. Good evening, Al. All right, so... With NSO Group, with the allegations against NSO Group uh, and, and Israel in mind, and, you know, with Khashoggi, how do you think that even if we were to successfully make ties with Saudi Arabia public, how do you think that would reflect on Israel? Well, when you talk about public relations, it's something totally different from what happens in the Middle East. Because in the Middle East, most relations are behind the scenes, like mushrooms, which grow better in the darkness. This is the philosophy, or the political philosophy of the Middle East. Unlike Europe, unlike America, which everything here, there is, or almost everything is public, here much is behind the scenes. There are relations between Israel and Saudi Arabia, and once in a while we have something leaked out, like the NSO and all kinds of other equipment which Israel sells or doesn't sell to Saudi Arabia. Yet, the question is whether to make it public or not. This is totally different on a different level. And here, actually, you face a problem where the Arabs are still say, saying that they are committed to the Palestinian problem. Yeah, so, the Saudi king actually yeah, just convened order, the summit. In that. order to cover the Saudi-Israeli cooperation, Saudi Arabia gave $150 million to UNRWA mm. in order to shut the Palestinians' mouth. And actually, last Friday, uh, December 7, uh, this, the sermon of the Al-Aqsa Mosque, which is the PA controlled, they actually praised the Saudis for giving this money to UNRWA. Means that Saudi Arabia is buying the Palestinian silence for relations with Israel. Mm. This is how it works. I see. All right. So, but wouldn't it be, I, I don't know, couldn't, couldn't we change the way that that works in the Middle East by leading, by example, by having a government? Because right now, by this mushroom kind of uh, doctrine, by working behind the scenes, you still have a, a vast majority of citizens in the Arab world who, you know, would, would rather look, not have relations with Israel. So wouldn't look, it be better to lead by example from the government? Look, the Middle East sharply divides between what you see on the picture, what you see right now on, the, on this picture, and what is behind the scenes. You see now Mohammed bin Salman. You don't know how many wives uh, his family have means his father, his uncles. This is something which nobody talks about because this is behind the scenes. You don't know what his relations with his brothers and cousins, which are very, very bad relations. Yeah. He, he has a whole tour. locking them up in a Hilton. He has a whole Ritz-Carlton. Oh, he Ritz has the you. whole turmoil against him in the family. And to, to say the truth, I'm not sure that he will eventually, he finally will be, the, will be the king. Because there is a big opposition against the man. You don't mm -hmm. see it on his face, because they cover. This is the culture of the Middle East, making face, as if mm -hmm. everything is under control, while inside you keep the turmoil. Okay, so this is the culture. All right. Uh, Dr. Kedar, thank you so much as always. No problem.
And Israeli forces in the north have now uncovered their third Hezbollah attack tunnel from Lebanon since the beginning of Operation Northern Shield last week. And according to Prime Minister Netanyahu, the tunnels are big enough to be used by motorcycles, small vehicles, and groups of people with intent to launch attacks in the Galilee. Now, while Israel has incapacitated the first three terror tunnels with explosives on the Israeli side, that's not going to be enough. The tunnels go hundreds of meters back into Lebanon, meaning that their complete destruction will likely involve either Lebanon's help or Israeli action over the border. In fact, Lebanon's ambassador to the UN claimed that Israel had breached the Lebanese communications grid by hacking into the telephone network and sending recorded messages to residents of the village of Kafir Kila, warning them of imminent explosions on Lebanese territory that might put their lives at risk. But Israel maintains that they will do whatever necessary to protect Israeli sovereignty. Israeli intelligence minister Israel Katz also said Friday that, quote, if we think that in order to thwart the tunnels, one needs to operate on the other side, then we will operate on the other side of the border, end quote. And anyway, the Israeli military said in a statement that it already showed one of the tunnels to the head of UNIFIL, Major General Stefano Del Col, and that the IDF, quote, holds the Lebanese government, the Lebanese armed forces, and the United Nations interim force in Lebanon, or UNIFIL, responsible for all events transpiring in and emanating from Lebanon, end quote. Events including just last night when three men believed to be Hezbollah members approached Israeli technical workers near the security fence. The IDF fired warning shots in accordance with the standard operating procedures, and the men withdrew. Meanwhile, as the IDF's focus now shifts to Hezbollah tunnels in the north, former Defense Minister Avigdor Lieberman is saying that the crisis in the, in the Galilee is not mutually exclusive to the one in the south, and that Hamas in Gaza is still owed an IDF retaliation for their indiscriminate rocket fire into Israel in November. He said, quote, taking action in the north does not justify inaction in the south, end quote. He continued that what's happening in the north is an engineering act, not a military operation, and that there's no need to put one over the other. Both can be dealt with. During a weekend interview with Channel 2 News, Lieberman also reiterated how he did not regret quitting as an act of protest against Prime Minister Netanyahu's inaction against Hamas. Similarly, he said that allowing Qatar to give Gaza $30 million over the last two months is, quote, buying quiet at the price of our national security and a surrender to Hamas and terror, end quote. And when IDF head Gadi Eisenkot advised against a ground invasion in the Strip, Lieberman reportedly said it felt like he was listening to the leadership of left-wing NGO Peace Now. But he added that a lot could be done to end Hamas terrorism without compromising troops in a ground operation in the Gaza Strip. He did not, however, fully explain what those options would be. The United States-sponsored resolution condemning Islamic terror group Hamas for launching rockets into Israel last month failed to pass by a two-thirds majority at the United Nations General Assembly on Thursday. And despite widely being expected to pass with ease, 87 world nations voted in favor of the measure, 58 voted against, 32 abstained, and 16 didn't vote. This marked the first time that Hamas terror organization in Gaza had been targeted by name for condemnation by the assembly. And ahead of the vote, Israel's ambassador to the UN, Dani Danone, expressed high hopes over the outcome. And the motion was brought forth last week as one of the final motions presented by United States ambassador to the UN, Nikki Haley, who tweeted that, quote, countries must now ask themselves, are they for or against Hamas's violence? The choice is clear for the United States. We hope it will be for the rest of the UN as well, end quote. Well, the world has apparently decided, and it wasn't with the U.S. and Israel. Though it is worth noting that the resolution would have passed had a two-thirds supermajority not been required, but Kuwait initiated a vote to require two-thirds vote, which passed just before. Today, we achieved a plurality. That plurality would have been a majority if the vote had not been hijacked by a political move of procedure. But in one strong, courageous voice, we have brought Hamas to justice. For those member states that rejected this resolution, you should be ashamed of yourselves. Wait when you will have to deal with terrorism in your own countries. Your silence in the face of evil reveals your true colors. It tells us what side you are really on, a side that does not care for the lives of innocent Israelis and innocent Palestinians who have fallen victim to the terrorists of Hamas. Now, before the vote, 
Ambassador Haley began with how the day could be a historic one, as not one single resolution condemning Hamas had been passed at the UN, while the General Assembly has passed over 700 against Israel. Quote, that more than anything else is a condemnation of the United Nations itself, Haley said. Then after the vote, Ambassador Haley reported that President Trump called and asked which countries the United States would need to sanction with funding cuts as punishment. She added that, quote, I'm not going to tell you what I told him, end quote. Palestinians and their supporters have, of course, lauded the outcome of Thursday's vote, however, blaming the United States for, quote, exacerbating tensions and undermining the collective serious efforts to de-escalate. In other news, in an historic move, the BDS movement has now been declared illegal for all municipalities in the South American nation of Chile. The Chilean National Comptroller ruled that boycotts against Israel are prohibited, and ILTV's Latin American correspondent is here with more. Joy, uh, tell me some good news here. Thanks, Aaron. Yes, as you said, this is an important defeat for the BDS movement in Chile and maybe in the region. And this decision follows many complaints from the Jewish community in Chile and the Chilean community in Israel after the municipality of Valdivia passed a motion back in June to ban the city from signing any kind of contract with any kind of company linked to Israel. And not only that, Valdivia also wanted to expel Israel's ambassador to Chile and declared itself, quote, the first municipality in Latin America free of Israeli apartheid, end quote. Wow. All right. Well, after hearing this, I totally understand the complaints coming from the Jewish community in the, uh, in the country. Uh, so what happened? So the Chilean National Control determined this week that the Valdivia motion is not legal because basically, even though the Chilean con constitution gives the local authorities some independence, this regulation was violating the Chilean national law that prohibits, quote, arbitrary discrimination that is based on considerations such as nationality. So the Valdivia boycott of Israel is totally illegal and the courts likewise considered it illegal. All right, well, so that's encouraging. Yeah. yeah, it is. And really, overall, this is an historic occasion. But we can't forget that at the same time, the Chilean Congress approved a resolution in November declaring East Jerusalem as the, cap the Palestinian capital, demanding to recognize the pre-1967 line, uh, lines as border, and condemning Israel for being an apartheid state. So there's still a lot of work to do here. Maybe so. But, you know, either way, I think we can end on, on the high note uh, and take this as a win for diplomacy and dialogue. Um, thanks for your report, Joy. Of course, Aaron. Now, as Israel warms up more and more to the Arab world, pro-Palestinian and Arab residents in these nations are still actively against normalization, as shown now this week in Tunisia. Dozens of pro-Palestinian demonstrators protested against Israel's policy towards the Palestinians and urged Tunis to reject normalizing ties with the Jewish state. Up until now, Tunisia and Israel have not had any diplomatic relations, and though Tunisia has largely been a model of tolerance amongst Arab nations, they have been experiencing an increase in Islamic extremism. So the protesters' goal is actually to push a law that would make relations with Israel a crime. And demonstrators held signs reading, quote, Palestine is Arab, no choice but rifles, and Tunisia is free, Zionists out. But further undermining any sort of legitimate message was the fact that protesters chose to demonstrate outside the nation's foreign ministry, with the only visible reason seemingly being that the country's newly elected tourism minister, René Trabelsi, is Jewish. Trabelsi has very little connection, if at all, to the Jewish state. Though he is the third Jew in Tunisia to become a minister of anything, and he regularly organizes pilgrimages to the Tunisian synagogue of Griba, where he's from. His passion for a Jewish and Muslim coexistence have also made him a prominent figure in the media's eyes. But as for the law criminalizing ties with Israel, Tunisia's government seems to not be taking the law too seriously. And the moderate Islamist party and Ahda warned that a bill like this would hurt international relations with Western nations. You used to be able to trust that the internet was private and anonymous, but today it's anything but. And there are many people out there actively trying to hack or otherwise exploit your personal information. Well, Israeli-founded company Cape Technologies is doing everything to protect you from a scenario like that. And their CEO, Ido Ehrlichman, is here to tell us more about it. Ido, thank you very much for coming in today. Thank you. Tell me about Cape Technologies and, you know, some of your products and, and uh, yeah. Cape Technologies is a cybersecurity business. We are listed on the London Stock Exchange. Mm. Our main product uh, is CyberGhost. It's a virtual private network, cross devices for iOS, uh, mobile, Android and PC. And our main goal is to improve digital privacy for millions of people around the world. As you know, uh, that internet, a lot of companies try to monitor the online behavior of consumers, mainly for marketing purposes. And we are here to give them back the opportunity to gain the control on the information they share online. 
So you're saying, okay, for all those people who you know don't really care, and they say, yeah, I love the targeted ads, it helps me buy stuff, then fine, go go with Google. But if you're looking to really be private and to surf the net without anybody prying into who you are or what you like or anything like that, then Ghost uh, Ghost is for you. Definitely, and I think that after the election in the U.S. and what happened with Facebook and Cambridge Analytics, people are much more aware about the need to have better digital privacy, and they are looking for solutions. And the CyberGhost VPN is a very straightforward solution that in one click you have a stable, fast and secured internet Wi-Fi connection. And I think it gives back a lot of confidence for people with everything that they're doing online. If it's banking or just uh, whatever you, you do. So, okay, so how does it work? Is this like, a, like an app that kind of sits in the background of your browser or is it an entirely new browser that, that you kind of go through for your, for your browsing history? And, no, and, it's, it's an application, whether it's be on your desktop or mobile. Mm -hmm. You download the app, you buy subscription, usually annual subscription, and in one click you have secured Wi-Fi connection that encrypts all the data that flows in and out the device that you are using. Regardless of the web browser that you're correct, using. Correct, correct. So you could be on Google and still be hidden by the VPN yeah. of Ghost. So Google will not be able to monitor or track your location, for example, or, ah. or tailor specific advertising based on your online profile. And it gives you, if, and if, or if you are in an airport and connect for an, a free Wi-Fi uh, network at an airport, for example, all the, everything that you do online is secured, encrypted, and nobody can follow there's what no, you're There's nobody in. nearby, you know, with a little Correct. skimmer or yeah. something who can steal your yeah. info. All right, so who, you know, who is this really for? Is this for, for big companies? Is this for individual browsers, uh, you know, tech wizards, or who is this for? We have millions of customers. We have more than two million paying customers, wow. and it's just growing. And it's a combination between consumers, our main market is the U.S. and Western European mm -hmm. countries, or small, small and medium-sized organizations that wants to have more secured internet connection to their employees when they do their or work in the organization or work remotely. You know, this is this sounds incredible. I'm going to go home and probably download this. Um, you know, so take back uh, take back your privacy with uh, with CyberGhost. Ido, thank you so much for coming in. Thank and you very us much. Thank you. And yet another special Hanukkah celebration. Hundreds of worshippers from all over the world gathered in Kerala, India on Thursday to mark the Paradisi Synagogue's 450th anniversary. It's also the synagogue's first time opening in prayer in nearly 50 years, as most of the congregants moved away in the 1950s and 60s. It's very great for me because my father was uh, born in uh, India and uh, came to Israel about uh, 55 years ago. And uh, it's very wonderful to see this. Originally built in 1567, the synagogue was left to ruin and the Jewish congregation dwindled in the area to just five. And after its closure, the synagogue was reportedly looted and damaged by extreme weather too. But now, with all new lighting and donated decorations, new and old, congregants who had long since moved away returned for a special candle lighting ceremony and three days of celebrations. In addition, the services were led using a handwritten Torah scroll that afterwards is set to go to the 818-year-old Kadavum Bagan synagogue nearby. In fact, there are seven synagogues that were formed in the Cochin Kerala area, and evidence does show Jewish history dating back to 70 AD in the Kerala area alone. Though just 5,000 Jews remain in all of India today, out of the nation's billion-strong population. With Israel being the leading startup nation, there are many initiatives practically coming out daily, but one that particularly stands out is a coding boot camp for African refugees in the heart of Tel Aviv, and ILTV's Doriel Mizrahi has the story. Doriel, thank you for coming in. Hey, Aaron. So this beautiful initiative just started two weeks ago. Mm. It's a coding boot camp, like you said, teaching everything from CSS to JavaScript. There's also HTML. There's a whole range of things, mm -hmm. and it's for African refugees. How long, how long does, the, uh, does the program go for? Okay, so it's like a three-month program. There's currently 12 people there right now. Okay. So they're like calling for more people. If people are interested, sure. they should go ahead and sign up. But for now, it's these 12 people. And really with one goal, to teach them to code and to get them out also in the market. It's going to be good for them because they'll have a profession to go out to the Israeli sure. market, to have like an amazing like a, a career. A skilled profession that they a can, A skilled yeah. profession. And also Israel is currently, there's a shortage of software developers and mm -hmm. coders. And this would be great, like, for both sides, just like a nice win-win situation. Yeah, I was just going to say that. It's like, you know, it's, it's good because, you know, unfortunately, in terms of integration into society, a lot of immigrants, uh, especially from, from Africa, you know, Ethiopia, Eritrea, et cetera, they have a lot of trouble integrating into the workforce here. Exactly. Um, and, and most often you see, you know, you see them as 
uh, you know, cleaners or, or uh, exactly. Yeah, you know, jobs and like this, which is fine, but you know, this this is really giving for, them a bigger platform. Exactly. Right, and like they even said, the best one is going to get a f another program for free, like a year program to learn coding, even like on a deeper level. So they're really trying to push this forward, mm -hmm. and they, it's not only this program. Like they have so many. It's like. Um, they want to do like a web development one and they want to teach them WordPress and there's so many programs for these people that they're just being like, come, learn. It's um, the Developers Institute and the African Refugee Center and they're joining forces to really push this initiative forward. All right, well, that's spectacular and I hope I hope everybody who can takes Me advantage too. of it and uh, I hope it grows. Me too. Uh, thanks for telling us about it, Doria. Thank you, Ryan. Now, we may not be able to see her too much in this movie, but Gal Gadot has moved to the animation scene in the Walt Disney Animation Studio project Ralph Breaks the Internet. And just over the weekend, the movie received a Golden Globe nomination that has Gadot excited to say the very least. Al-TV's Emmanuel Kadosh has the details. Hi, yeah, Aaron. Thank you. Well, Gadot and the rest of Israel, we may yes, not be able to physically see Gadot on the screen, but you can totally tell it's her in the latest animated movie, mm. Ralph Breaks the Internet, which is a sequel to the movie Wreck-It Ralph. And in the movie, Gadot lent her voice to the character Shank, who is a tough and talented driver in an intense and gritty online racing game called Slaughterhouse. Obviously. And, yeah, clearly. <laughs> and the movie has earned a nomination in the Best Animated Film category with the Globes. All right, so I feel like, you know, Gadot's career has just taken off like a rocket. Definitely. And it's really incredible. And honestly, you know, it's so much fun to hear her distinct and proud <laughs> Israeli accent in yes. such a cool context. You know, it adds so much to her character. And, and as you know, I'm a huge fan of animation. Mm -hmm. So this movie has me over the moon, for one. As you should be. Ralph Breaks the Internet is actually being pitted against the movie's Incredible 2, Isle of Dogs, and Spider-Man into the Spider-Verse, which... On a side note, I don't know how many more Spider-Man movies are really going to be coming out. All of these movies have made huge waves in box offices since their release, but I have a lot of faith in Ralph Breaks the Internet, and I have a feeling that they'll win. Okay, so first off, there's <laughs> never, ever a shortage of Spider-Man movies. I just want to get right, that Aaron. out of the way. So relax, <laughs> all right? Secondly, my honest opinion is that, you know, is that a bit of confusion? Because all the movies you just mentioned are incredible. Isle of Dogs, Spider-Verse, uh, right. and, and Wreck-It Ralph, uh, number two, Ralph Breaks the Internet. It's amazing. So I'm curious to see how, you know, Ralph Breaks the Internet faces off at the actual award ceremony still. Uh, you know, obviously my fingers are crossed for of Gadot. Course. She's already made waves as Wonder Woman, uh, and then in The Simpsons, yes. and now here. So this could really be a game changer for her, and we're all Beyond hoping. game changer, definitely. Mm -hmm. This is going to open doors for her in the movie industry like never before. She shared the good news on Instagram, on an Instagram post that states, quote, bucket, I bucket list item checked off. Be in part of a musical number in a Disney movie. So, bam, there you have it. All right, just like that. Mm-hmm. All right, well, if you haven't seen Ralph Breaks the Internet, it's still in theaters, so please check it out. You will not regret it. Uh, Anna Manuel, thanks for the update. Thanks, Aaron. And now for our Hebrew word of the day. The IDF is now in the midst of Operation Northern Shield, which was launched to expose Hezbollah's terror tunnels entering Israel from Lebanon. So today's word is minhara, meaning tunnel. A tunnel, or a minara, is an artificial underground passage, and some tunnels, or minarot, are built on highways to keep the hill intact over top so that livestock and other such things can cross from one side to the other safely. But then there are also tunnels or minarot used for terrorism, the likes of which northern Israeli citizens have been complaining about for years. Luckily for us, the Operation Northern Shield shows at least that the IDF is working tirelessly to keep Israel safe. Now let's go ahead and take a look at the weather forecast. Tonight should be partly cloudy and uh, with a chance of rain. The low will be around 56 or 13 degrees Celsius. Then tomorrow the weather should clear up a bit with a slightly warmer high of 68 or 20 degrees Celsius. All right, that's it for today's news. Today's exchange rate is 3.73 shekels to the American dollar. Remember to sign up for our daily newsletter at ILTV.TV and don't forget to follow us on Facebook at Israel English News and on Twitter at ILTV News. I'm Aaron Porras and thank you for watching. And now stay tuned for the eighth and final night of Hanukkah's candle lighting. All right. Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu melech haolam, sher kidshanu mitzvotav, betsivanu lead likner Hanukkah. Having some difficulties on the eighth night of Hanukkah. This is why our ancestors used oil. Oh. Alright. And with that, Hanukkah is over.
Happy Hanukkah, everybody. Happy holidays. Happy Christmas, happy Kwanzaa, and happy new year. <laughs>